This is Django Rips, a podcast for learning web application development in Python using the Django web framework. We explore all of Django's features to equip you with the knowledge to build your own web app. I'm your host, Matt Lehman. Episode 3, Views on Django. Welcome back to Django Riffs. On the last episode, we talked about URLs, which are kind of the front door to working with Django. So when your user visits your website or your application, URLs are going to be the main mechanism to describe what's available, which places they can click to, what routes that your application will respond to. But that's only part of the story. More of a story involves the code that powers those URLs. And, and in the last episode, we briefly touched on that code and what that is. But today, we're going to explore that in a lot more depth. And that piece of code that we have to consider is views. So what is a view? A view is a chunk of code that receives an HTTP request and returns an HTTP response. Views sort of describe Django's entire purpose, to respond to requests made to an application on the internet. If you think about it, though, chunk of code that I've described is very generic. And I kind of was deliberate when I used that term. And I was deliberate because there are multiple kinds of views in Django. It doesn't have to be one specific kind. And we're going to look at the various kinds that are in there. Let's start with what I think is the easiest approach uh, for considering views, and that is with function-based views. A function-based view is exactly what it sounds like. It, It is a function, a Python function, and it has a fairly simplistic interface. It is a function that minimally takes an HTTP request object and returns some kind of HTTP response. So let's consider an example. If we have an application views.py file, we can import HTTP response from django.http. And then we can have a function named, in this case I'm choosing hello world, but it could be anything, that will take a request object as its input argument. The hello world of functions is to return an HTTP object, and that HTTP object will have a string uh, as its input parameter, and that string can say hello world. So that is the simplest possible version of a view you could have in Django. It is a function that takes one input and returns one output. So we would take this view and we would connect it to a URL configuration, as we saw in the last uh, episode. And that's the entirety of it, which I think is pretty amazing, because if you think about what's really going on, there's, there's a lot happening there. Django is doing so much work for us. It is taking that input request, which, which remember, is in a totally different format from what Python is used to and it parses it apart, puts it into a specific kind of object that this function can handle, and our job in a single line is to return a string, the equivalent of a print statement, if you will, and Django that will then take that string and package it up into a proper HTTP response that will go out and show back up at the user's browser on the other side And when they reach that URL, which will exercise that view code, they will see that string of hello world in their browser. I think that's pretty amazing that Django has provided all that functionality for us with very little effort. So I think we need to consider what are the pieces that go into making a view work? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? And as I've noted, there are a couple of major components. Let's start with the HTTP request. HTTP request in this context is a Python class. Instances of this represent a literal HTTP request, as in 
the HTTP protocol. Well, that's a bit redundant. It's because it's hypertext transfer protocol. But it's, it's the format that we've described earlier and in other places um, that I have on my website and, and so on. You can learn more about it there. So I will describe an HTTP request for this example and walk through this section. If it gets a little overwhelming, remember, I've got show notes that are up online available on my website that you can check out and review the details in case anything doesn't come through clearly in audio format. An HTTP request starts with an HTTP method. In this example, I'm going to use the method of POST, and it's all in capitalized form, followed by a space, followed by some sort of URL path. Now, not a full path that includes the actual website domain and all that stuff, but everything after the domain. So my example has some data from a website that I'm building as a side project, and it reads as slash courses slash some long UUID slash edit, and that's sort of the end of it. At the tail end of that, there is an identifier that says which version of HTTP we want to use. And so it says HTTP slash 1.1 for that particular version of HTTP. After that first line are a bunch of items which are called headers. Headers are sort of the metadata that go along with an HTTP request. So we have headers, and, and I guess I should say they take a form that is the header name followed by a colon, then a space, and then the value for that header. There are a number of headers here in my example, and if you were to inspect your traffic on your browser with um, the Chrome DevTools or Firefox DevTools or any of these things, you'd be able to see some of these headers yourself. So you'll encounter headers like host, which describes the domain. You will see things like accept language, accept encoding, the content type, content length. All of these things are metadata that describe the request. And Django will use them in various ways, and we can use them too, as we'll see shortly. Since I'm describing a post request, there's actually a way to add additional data that we can consider. And so after the headers, there is one blank line, and then what goes into the rest of the request. In this case, since it is a uh, form data content type request, there's a bunch of data that looks like key value pairs of a variable name with an equal sign and then a value. They're joined together by an ampersand character to put all of this data together. But that's really more of a detail of the form data and not specific to other types of data that can appear in a request body. We've got our example to consider when we are thinking about HTTP request, the Python class, which is a Django class. And what Django will do is take that in incoming HTTP request, which has already been transformed as a reminder um, by the web server gateway interface. So it's not even the same raw format that I just described. It's actually some intermediate form, but it's going to transform it into a format that is very useful within Django. It's put into a class that is given some nice attributes, some nice methods that we can use with our functions, with our views generally. Let's look at some of the attributes. The first one I'm going to consider is, is method. So in the example, I said that the request that I was sending was a post. So the method attribute would be the string of post. In, and Django sticks with the HTTP, HTTP method names, so they would be in all caps. The second attribute that you'll find on a request is the content type. Uh, this corresponds to the content type header that was found in the request. And in the example case, it's application slash x www form URL encoded. And the content type tells you what was submitted in the request, which was user form data, form data in this example, but it could be any form that your browser is capable of sending. There's another attribute that's called post. And this sounds a little weird because, hey, we just said a minute ago that we have method, but this is actually something different. Post is the processed data that actually came from the request. So this is a dictionary-like structure 
And in my example earlier, I didn't mention it, but one of the pieces of data that went into the form data was, as I said, a key value pair which uh, with, with a key name, equal, and then some value. And so my example includes the name equal science in my particular example. And so if you were accessing the post off of the request, you would do request.post and then in square brackets, the string of name. And the result of that would be the value of science. So it, it, it behaves just like a dictionary in that context. Similarly, there is another dictionary-like object that is request.get. This is for the query string. Query string is the portion of the URL that you might see sometimes that is after a question mark character. And this also will behave with key value pairs that are separated by an equal sign and can be joined together to have multiple with an ampersand. So you might encounter a string that has query student equal mat or something like that. And if you were to access that, student would be the key that you would look in the dictionary and it would have a value like mat. There's also a way to access the headers generally and that is request.headers. This is another dictionary-like attribute that is accessible and in past versions of Django you might have to access this more with a different dictionary-like structure called request.meta which is still available but I believe that request.headers was added as a convenience to get directly to the headers that you might care about. So another thing worth noting about Django request objects is that because of them passing through many parts of the Django framework, requests are often used as a vehicle to pass in extra data. So if you're doing user management, for example, a user object might be attached to the request object as an attribute like request.user. Or if you need to access session data and cookie data, all of these things are accessible by checking on attributes of request. So it's this really convenient wrapper around all sorts of different inputs that you might experience in your Django views. There is one kind of data that does not necessarily go get attached to the request, and that is what we saw in the last episode when we were talking about URL parameters and converters. Those pieces of data that go with the URL are added to the view separately from the request. If you had a converter that had a key name of UUID and a function, view function, to react to it, then your function would take as its first parameter the request argument, and the second parameter would be a variable that you would call UUID. And that is how Django would pass that information along to you from the URL. So that's the input side of this equation. We also need to consider the output side. And that is the HTTP response object. It's the other major interface that you'll use when working with requests. Our job as Django developers is to produce a response. That's the whole point of what we're doing. Users are supplying requests. We get the request processed to us by the framework. And the job that is in front of us is to send back a response that makes sense for their request. So we have this response object that we can use and attach data to similarly. And there are a couple of major attributes that I want to address here. One is the status code. So when a request comes in, the browser is going to expect a response. And sometimes that response is a good response. Sometimes it is a bad response. The default HTTP response for a, a good state is most often going to be a 200 response. These are numeric responses that are defined by the specification. Uh, but you also might encounter error conditions. These are going to be any number from 400 and above uh, that will indicate that something was not good about the request. Very commonly you'll encounter a 404 error, which is a not found error. So that is something that almost everyone has experienced at some point or, or another while browsing the internet. And now you know where that's coming from. It's an HTTP error code that describes what to do 
when something is not found on the server side. There are a number of well-defined error codes that you can go read about in the specification, and we'll use plenty of them when working with Django. The other piece that goes along with an HTTP response that's most noteworthy is the content attribute. When you're building a response, and I, I listed an example earlier that was HTTP response and passed a string value into it, that string value is not necessarily what will end up at the browser on the other side. Your response is going to be manipulated based on what the user's browser can accept. And in most scenarios, that's going to be something like a binary encoded UTF-8 data, which is an encoding format that's a, a, a standard that's well used throughout the world. And so what Django does is it takes your string data and encodes it into binary data. And so if you were to create that response object and then look at the response.content attribute, what you'll actually see is not a string, the string that you passed into your response object, but the binary version of that that has been encoded in the default encoding. You can override that value, but there is a default encoding on there. We're going to work with HTTP responses. And we may not work directly with an HTTP response. There's actually a variety of HTTP response classes. So HTTP response acts as the parent class of many others. And you will encounter some of these others along the way and want to use them for certain circumstances. For example, you may encounter the HTTP response redirect class. And the job of this class is to issue a redirect code, one of the other HTTP status codes, and that instructs the browser to go somewhere else, to go to a different URL. So basically saying, this isn't here anymore, go look for this somewhere else. Another common one is HTTP response not found, and that corresponds to our 404 status code that I mentioned just a moment ago. In most circumstances, to be honest, you're really not going to use this one directly. It's used more as a side effect of a couple of other cases. One common case is to import an exception class called HTTP 404, and that class is uh, something that you can use when data is not found in the format that a user expects it to be found. And so you raise the exception, and the framework ex itself will catch the exception and return an HTTP response not found. There's another subclass which will be pretty common for permission control, which is the HTTP response forbidden that corresponds to yet another HTTP error status code that is trying to protect uh, your website or, or indicate to users that they've done something that they're not permitted to do. Another final one to consider, another final response to consider, is the JSON response. I have not described JSON at all, to my knowledge, uh, but JSON is a data format that is commonly used on the web. When we get to a future discussion talking about uh, web APIs, JSON is a format that you will be able to use to provide that data back to a client. This is commonly used, it, JSON actually stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and so it's a method to do essentially a nesting of dictionaries and lists and values and all sorts of things, and it maps fairly cleanly to Python's native data structures of dictionaries and lists and values and those sort of things. And so there's a, a well-defined spec that you can go read probably in about 10 minutes at json.org that can give you get you up to speed on what that data is and, and is something that we will use in Django not necessarily all the time, but if you're building an API and you're not using an extension tool like Django REST framework, then JSON response is a good tool to reach for. And what it really is is an HTTP response class that has a content type set to the JSON application content type. So there are other ways to get HTTP response instances that don't involve you directly creating one yourself. 
And the most common one, to my knowledge, is the render function. So render is a function that works with a system called templates, and, and templates are going to be the primary subject of the next episode, so I won't dive too much into them, but they're very well worth knowing, at least briefly in this one, because they are something that return an HTTP response. Render as a function, its job is to take some data, some usually layout data, like HTML structural content, that can then be sent to with the response as the thing that you want to send back. So let's consider the most rudimentary version of a way you might want to send a bunch of HTML, and then we'll contrast that with render. So consider importing HTTP response from django.http, and then we have a function view called myHTMLView that takes a request as an input parameter. Within the body of that function, I've created a variable called response content. And I'm using a, a triple quote string to make a multi-line string. And in that, I'm, I'm putting a big blob of HTML. So I'm including HTML tags, head tags, body. All of this stuff is going into the string. And my view is returning an HTTP response with res this response content. This view example works for this scenario and could be a way that you could develop views, but it has a lot of shortcomings that are really not desirable. The first problem with it is that this HTML chunk that we've embedded in this variable inside of this function is not reusable by other views in the system. So if you have a common layout that you want on your website and you want to share with different web pages, you're going to have a really hard time doing that if you're choosing to copy things around and put them into variables that go inside your functions. It just doesn't work well. The second issue that I have with it, and that I think a lot of people have with it, is that you're mixing Python and HTML together. And it, it's going to get messy. There's a, a rich history of tools and techniques in computer science over the years uh, with internet, notably uh, CGI for the common gateway interface, that mix programming language and output format together. And let's just say it didn't end very well and is not commonly used today. Another challenge that you're going to have with this technique is how do you even put HTML together? You could, I guess in theory, string them together with a bunch of join operations or string concatenation of different kinds but again, you're going to be left with a big mess on your hands. Now it's time to consider the alternative. In a views.py file, we're going to import from django.shortcuts, import render. And we're going to have the same function base view called myHTMLView, which will take a request. But this time it's going to return, and the thing it's going to return is actually a call to render. And render will take as its first argument the request itself. And the second argument is a string that is has a value of template.html. And a third ar argument for now is an empty, empty dictionary, which is the context, which we don't need to worry about for this discussion. And then you'd also have a secondary file, which would be called template.html, which would take that same HTML blob that we had in our previous example and that would be it. So what's noteworthy about this example is that we've separated the template, the layout, the structural content from the logic. So if we had more Python logic to exercise in our view, our example is very simple and it didn't, but if we had more in there, it would be very clear to see that because we wouldn't be blending Python and HTML. There's way more that goes into templates and so much more that I'm totally glossing over right now, but it gives you an idea of where our HTML can go if we're trying to build a website using Python and Django. So that sort of wraps up HTTP request and HTTP response. We've seen function-based views as a nice and clean and simple way to take an input and return an output, but it is not the only way that we can do views. So the next type of view that I want us to consider are view classes.
view classes are things that derive from Django's view class, predictably. They're often called class-based views, which are abbreviated to CBVs generally, and take some certain methods that match up to the HTTP methods. Let's make that more concrete with an example. We've got another application views.py file. This time we're importing HTTP response from django.http, and we're also going to import view from django.views.generic.base. The first part of our class base view is to create a class, and I'm calling my class sample view, and it's going to subclass from view. So it's going to have view in parentheses after the name. And the method that it's going to take is a get method. And it will have the self attribute as the first argument, and request as the second argument, and star args as the third, and star star keyword args as the fourth. And it will finally return an HTTP response with a string that I'm calling hello from CBV. So in this example, the get method on the class corresponds directly with the get HTTP request method. And this relationship holds for all the other methods. So if you wanted to make a class-based view that handled a post request, you would write a post method on the class-based view. Finally, to hook this sample view into the URL, we have to do something slightly different from a function-based view. So in a urls.py file, we're going to have path from django.urls and our sample view from the application views module, and our URL patterns that we saw in the last episode, and a call to path. The string doesn't matter because it's just an example, but the thing that does matter is we want to say sample view dot as view as a, and as a class method call. This class method call, its job is to return a callable object that will basically wrap up the view method that we added earlier, the get method, and make it so that that will respond when that particular path, URL conf path, is called. If you've been following along at this point and this far, you might wonder what is the value of a class-based view. And I would not blame you at all. It sounds like a ton of boilerplate when a function-based view sounds very clean. It has a very clear input and very clear output. And the class-based view has a bunch of extra stuff around it that doesn't seem necessary. If we stopped there, I would totally agree with you. I would say stick with function-based views. There would be very little or no value to using class-based views. But as with many things, there's a lot of power under the hood when you start uh, considering how they can be built and composed together. So one of the advantages of class-based views is inheritance, is the power that comes with object orientation in Python. We can build things together using pieces and leverage a lot of pieces that have already been built for us, frankly. Well, let's consider some of the out-of-the-box views that, that Django provides that are class-based views that take advantage of some of this functionality and can make short work of views that you might otherwise have to write for yourself. A simple example to consider to start is a redirect view. This will return an HTTP response redirect instance. As we described earlier, that's a subclass of HTTP response. And the nice part about this view is you don't even need to subclass this thing yourself. You can use it directly for circumstances where all you need to do is point to a different view. So let's look at an example. The example we're going to look at is a project urls.py file. And again, we're going to import path from django.urls. And this time we're going to import redirect view from django.views.generic.base. And for good measure, we're going to also import a new view from application.views. So the example that I'm trying to set up is we have a new view and we had an old view. 
and we want the old view to point to the new view. Hopefully that's clear. If it's not, again, reminder, there are show notes that include all of these examples along the way, so you can check this out yourself. In our example, we have the new path, and that will be the thing that we'll call newview.asView. And we're going to give this view path a name of new-view. We also have our old path. The old path is a thing that we want to point to the new thing. So this is where we use redirect view. And again, we're going to use dot as view because that will create the callable that we need. But this time we're going to pass in a parameter to that as view call. And we're going to use pattern name and we're going to give it the value of a string of new dash view, which will point to the name that matches with the new view right above it. What Django has done for us is created the right callable that will do the proper redirection of going from the old path to the new path automatically for us. And we got that benefit without subclassing by taking advantage of something from as view. As view for an, any argument that's passed to it will be added and to override any class attributes on a view and create a new new instance. So in this circumstance, we passed in pattern name, which was a class attribute that is expected on redirect view if you want to match to an existing URL. Another useful view that we can consider is the template view. So again, I'm not going to go into templates in depth, but because of what templates function as in the system, they're really critically important. And so we need easy ways to create template views, or views that use templates, I should say. And template view, the class-based view, is a quick and easy way to do that. So our, our new example is going to look like this. In an application views.py file, we're going to import template view from django.views.generic.base. And our view name in this example is going to be home view, and it's going to subclass from template view. And the only parameter that it needs to add to it to be fully functional is a class attribute named template name with a string value of home.html. With two lines of code, or I guess three if you count the import, we're able to wire together a new view that will point to our new template of home.html. Pretty straightforward. I like it. There are a wide variety of other class-based views, but we have not covered all of the material yet to make them make sense. So I'm going to describe some generically so that you know that these things exist, and then when we get to those subjects, you can start to dive in more and look, up, look them up on your own. There are views that will display and handle HTML forms, so users can input data and send the data back to an application. There are other class-based views that can pull data from a database for an individual record from the database and show a web page. Uh, for example, this might be a web page about an individual movie or something along those lines. There is another kind of class-based view that can pull data from a database and show information about a collection of records. So sticking with the, the movie theme, if you're making a movie website, if you had a page that showed the cast of actors that might appear in a movie, that would be possible with some of these other class-based views. We also have views that will allow us to create or update data that will be persisted back to a database. And there are some rather odd views that frankly I've never used myself, but there are views that can do things related to time specifically, time ranges like days, weeks, and months. So if you're trying to make archive kind of pages and those sort of things, those are built into Django as well. So I'm not going to describe any of what those names are because it's more information than you need right now and you're, you're sort of lacking the context if you're joining me from, from the beginning with your Django experience. So let's move on and talk about view decorators and mixins. Decorators are a feature of Python and many other languages, frankly. They might come under a different name like annotations, but they allow you 
the ability to extend a function with additional capabilities. So a decorator works by wrapping a function with what amounts to the same interface and it returns whatever that function returned. But along the way, it can provide additional functionality based on that wrapper. And so this is a useful mechanism for sprinkling on new functionality for views uh, that you have in your system. And it's a good way to get reusable content out of function-based views. Let's talk about some decorators that are worth knowing that we should consider. The first one I will want to look at is what you can do if you need to work with multiple HTTP methods, or when you don't need to work with multiple HTTP methods might be more accurate. So if we have an example that is application views.py, and we have our HTTP response, which again will import from django.http, and this time we're going to create a view function named multi-method view. And it's going to take our request attribute, and in the body of this view, we're ha we have an if clause. And this if clause says if request.method equal equal get, the string get. It will return an HTTP response that says method was a get as the content. There's an LF branch on this example that has request.method equal equal post, which will return an HTTP response with the content of method was a post as a string. That view has two methods in play. It's reacting to whether the request was a get or a post. By default, if you make no changes to your function, a request that is sent to that URL could be any of the method types. This might not be what you want to do. So let's say you want to have only a post request. You're expecting data to be coming in from your user so you can handle it and save it or do something with it, process it. And how would you guard yourself from any other type of request? Well, there's a couple of ways that you can do this without doing any sort of special stuff. And let's consider both of those paths. So this time we're going to have our application views.py file, and we're going to import two things. We're going to import HTTP response from Django HTTP, but we're also going to import HTTP 404, which is an exception class. Our first function view, I'm calling guard clause view, and it will take the request as an input object. And in the body, it will say if request.method not equal post, then it will raise an HTTP 404. Otherwise, it will fall through that if clause and return an HTTP response with method was a post, as in our previous example. Or we can have another function kind of view, which I'm calling if clause view, which will take a request object. In the body of that function, it will take an if clause that says if request.method equals post, return HTTP response, method was a post, else raise HTTP 404. Both of these techniques work. They do the job so that if you have a function view that you only want to handle a post, you could take either format. And you might have opinions on why you would choose one over the other, but I would actually recommend you choose the third option, which is to use a decorator that simplifies this in a nice way. We're going to consider our example again, and we're in application views.py, and we're importing the same HTTP 404 and HTTP response, but now we're also going to import require post from django.view views.decorators.http. And this time we have a function view, which I'm simply calling the view, that takes a request object and returns an HTTP response of method was a post. I've removed any if guards, so we need to do something different if we want it to ignore get requests and options and all of these other methods that come along with HTTP. So we're going to take the decorator, require post, and we're going to put it above the view function. 
with an at sign require post. The at sign, that's not unique to Django. That is just Python syntax for decorators. Hopefully you're familiar with it if you have Python experience. And it is going to guard us from having to deal with any other type of request. So the processing of the guard clause and all the other stuff that might have been in the that was in the other examples, it can be skipped because the require post is handling that for us. To me, this version feels a lot more declarative. You're you're specifying an input that is almost like a design by contract sort of scenario, and it's telling the reader exactly what kind of request will be coming in to this view. And they don't have to think about if logic, they don't have to see any extra nesting, that's all handled for them by the decorator. So that's pretty nice. Another decorator that you may encounter is the login required decorator. And this will make more sense when we get to the subject of user management, but I'm just trying to give you an example of a couple of useful decorators that exist in the system. I think this is one that you will see commonly. But the login required decorator is something that you want to use when you want to create a protected view that only someone who is logged into your system can access. And all of that user management stuff will be covered um, in a different topic, but we can still give an example to make sense of this. So we have a views.py file. We're importing HTTP response from the same place, django.http. And now we're going to import login required from django.contrib.auth.decorators. And we've got our function-based view called the view, which will take a request object and return an HTTP response with a string of this view is only viewable to authenticated users. And in order to ensure that that happens, we add a login required decorator above it of at sign login required. And that check will ensure that that view will only be accessible to someone who is authenticated. And if they are not authenticated, they will be redirected back to a login page to give them the opportunity to do that. Our final example is a bit more complicated and also relates to the user management system, but it is something to check something more specific about the user. In the first example, we were considering just authentication. That means that you are in the system, you have proven who you are, and the, this example is more going to be about authorization, which is about who, what you can do based on who you are. So a sense of control rather than just identity. And so this example is going to be applications views.py again, and we're going to import our H, trusty HTTP response class, but this time we're also going to import from django.contrib.auth.decorators import user passes test. And we've got our the view again, which will take a request object and return an HTTP response that is with a string of only visible to staff users. And it's only visible to staff users because of our decorator that we're going to add. So the decorator is at user passes test. And this time we have to do a little bit more. We have to add some parentheses and basically call this decorator like a function itself. And the decorator is going to be called with a lambda function. The lambda function says lambda user colon user is staff. This is an interesting decorator in that it takes an input. And I guess it's even more interesting in that the input itself is a function object. So we've got functions on functions on functions here, which is hopefully not too confusing, but let's see if I can make sense of this for, for everyone. The way that user passes test works is it protects the view from being called if the function object that is it passed as its input evaluates to false. If it evaluates to true, then it will permit the request to go through. The test function that it's called is something that will take an input argument of a user. And so that's why we're able to create a lambda that takes one argument. And user.isStaff is a Boolean that exists on the user object that we'll talk about in the future. So it's saying if the user who has been authenticated 
is a staff level user or has that true value, then they've passed the test and they're allowed to look at the view. So that's how that particular decorator works. Another final interesting thing to note before we move on to the other type of, of way to handle extra functionality is that decorators stack on top of each other. You, because of the way that Python implements decorators and the fact that they wrap, you can put multiple decorators together. For instance, we can take our require post, we can take our user passes test, we can take our view and we can put them all together on top of each other so that we can create a view that is only accessible to a staff level user that will only receive post data. And that's by saying the view request, HTTP response with some string, and above it you would say at require post, and below that line you'd say at user passes test with the lambda that I just described a moment ago. So the, all of these things would stack above the definition of the function line. So that's decorators in a nutshell. And there's probably more that I could cover, but it gives you a flavor of some of the things that are in there. And to note, we can make our own decorators ourselves if we wanted. In fact, we can take the user passes test and make our own kind of custom version of this. Like say we didn't want to pass in that lambda every time. We could make a decorator that evaluates and call it staff only. And so we could have a staff only decorator that would skip all of that extra stuff, a little bit less code to repeat in multiple views. Similarly to decorators are mixing classes. These classes are used by class-based views, and they are functionally equivalent to decorators for function-based views. This isn't 100% true because it's possible to use decorators for class-based views, but I'm not going to outline that example right now because it's a little bit more complex. Mixing classes work by adding them to the, the set of parents that you would add for your view. So we're going to talk about two mixing classes to make this a bit more concrete, and they're counterparts to a couple of decorators we've already seen. Like the login required and the user passes test decorator, there is a login required mixin and user passes test mixin class. If we have an example, such as a template, a couple of template views, we can make this hopefully more clear. We're going to have an example that is application views.py, and we're going to import the template view that we saw earlier from django.views.generic.base. We're also going to import our two mixin classes, login required mixin and user passes test mixin from django.contrib.auth.mixins. So our first example is going to show the login required mixin only. So we have a class view that is named home view, and the first parent class that's in there is the login required mixin followed by the template view as two classes to subclass from. And the, we'll have the template name class attribute of home.html as the value. And what this will do is force this home view to only be accessible to those who have authenticated and are logged in. We can also create a staff only kind of view, and I'm calling this one staff protected view. And we're going to give it the user passes test mixin as the first class and the template view as the other class that are, are the two parents. We give it a template name class attribute of staff eyes only .html. And to make this user pass test mixin work, we have to define a method on here called test func, which will take the self attribute because that's what methods do and it needs to return a boolean. So in this context, we are going to return self.request.user.isStaff. I forgot to note earlier that the class-based views get the request object attached to the instance so it's accessible in all of the methods. One thing worth noting about mixins is that the ordering is important. Because of the way that Django handles multiple inheritance, because that's exactly what we're doing in this context, we're 
giving a class multiple parents, so we have to deal with the implications of multiple inheritance, it is best to put mixing classes first because mixins are designed to augment the behavior of other classes. If you have a mixin, for instance, that needs to change something about a get method and you were to put it after the view, then because of how method resolution order works in Python, it's possible that your mixin may not be called in the way you expect if you don't put it first. If you're using class-based views and you're going to use mixins, remember to put them first. There are other mixin types that are, are in the system. Uh, but a lot of them are for details that we have not covered yet, so I'm not going to explore them too much. But if you would like to see them yourself and see the wide variety that there are, you can check out a website called ccbv.co.uk, which is the classy class-based views website. It's something that someone in the community put together, and I'm sorry I don't know who to attribute that to, but it's a really great resource, and it's a, a resource that lets you click around and see what the class-based views are that are built into Django and how they are built. Because a lot of the built-in views that come with Django are actually largely a composition of mixins that are put together that in their various composed forms provide the functionality that we need. That is bringing us to an end on view fundamentals. We have looked at view functions and we have looked at HTTP request and HTTP response. We looked at view classes and considered some of the built-in supporting views that are there. And then we talked about decorators and mixins and things that can supercharge your views with extra capabilities. On the next episode, we're going to look at templates in more depth. Templates are a sub-language within Django that are your primary tool for making user interfaces when you're working with Django's built-in features. Full show notes for this episode are available at www.mattlayman.com slash Django Riffs slash three. Thanks for listening to this episode of Django Riffs. You can follow the show at DjangoRiffs.com. If you have something to share, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is mblayman, or follow the Django Riffs handle to keep up with the show. If you've enjoyed the show, please rate or review on iTunes, Spotify, or from wherever you listen to podcasts. Your rating will help others discover the podcast, and I would be very grateful. Django Riffs is supported by listeners like you. If you can contribute financially to cover hosting and production costs, please check out my Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash mblayman. The theme music for Django Riffs is Open Roads, used with permission from Purple Planet Music. I hope you'll join us next time to learn more about Django. Take care. <laughs>